Okay. You can. second half today we also uh, will talk a little bit about your research topics and what happened in the next, next week when Alejandro is here. <coughs> um, so, but the first, first one and a half hours are basically, the first half of the hours are dedicated to uh, our visitor. Uh, invi I invited Robert Calvert, who is an associate professor at the Victor and I met Robert first about probably four years ago, where yeah, they organized a conference about informal cities, and he invited actually Alejandro Echeverri to that conference. And this is the first time I heard Alejandro talk about his work, so um, I'm really excited that Robert is the first one to do a talk in this class because some sense his conference started my engagement with me. So I'm grateful for that. And uh, Robert has similar interests than I. He's an architect. And of course, he just talked before a little bit. He operates between architecture and design and planning. So he kind of is strategically located there. And that's also a very good spot to be in when you work with uh, informal urbanism. Where you have to be, have to have an approach that's multi scalar, where you come from a larger scale down to the small scale and back. So that's, that's something that's really a, uh, an asset if you do that. Um, I talked to Robert about the potential topic he wants to talk about, and he said he, because he's very familiar with me, he's done the research there, he has traveled quite a bit there, um, <coughs> and so he wanted to talk say, more about a methodology, how to, as a designer, how to approach informal urbanism. And he has worked on that for a while now. And I told him, okay, you have 20 to 30 minutes. I said, wow, that's really short for what I'm basically thinking of. So I granted him a little bit more time, like 40 minutes, but we won't hold him accountable. Um, but. Robert will basically present his theory, and then we should have ample time to have a discussion with him. Um, I told Robert that you don't know yet too much about Medellin, but you already started a little bit of engaging the topic of informal urbanism. So thank you very much for coming, and please welcome Robert Cumbert. Thank you. Thank you for having me. And that, is there a way to um, dim the light? Uh, Yes. yes, thanks. So I'm, I'm very uh, flattered and gratified to have this chance to speak with people who share my interests in Medellin. Uh, I don't often get a chance at my own uh, institution to, uh, to engage on too many, uh, with too many people on this topic, so um, I'm always looking for an opportunity. And um, <clears throat> my presentation... Um, presumes either that you already know a lot about Medellin or that um, before you go into knowing a lot, uh, it's useful to uh, establish or at least have in mind a framework for the uh, exploration. And so this is more about the framework of exploring Medellin than uh, the actual details of Medellin or the results of an investigation of Medellin. Um, 
because this framework emerges out of my own initial investigations of Medellin, um, they are to a large extent a product of what is there on the ground right now. Uh, so these, this framework does in part emerge out of the actual conditions in Medellin, but they also emerge out of my own experience and probably more uh, explicitly out of um, the larger framings of history and theory of architecture and the design professions generally. So um, as I start out on this presentation, it's going to seem impossibly grandiose and global, <clears throat> but I hope uh, we can quickly establish that framework as the basis for moving in and looking at um, what you will be doing, uh, which will be very detailed, hopefully. Um, so with that preamble, um, I'm calling this presentation Reflex City, Medellin's Second Modernity. Now there are two key terms, oh, spelled wrong, sorry about that. Um, two key terms here, one is reflex. And reflex is a very commonplace term that we know what that means. Um, but the way, uh, what I'm proposing uh, as a framework here revolves around a word related to the word reflex, which is the word reflexivity. And the word reflexivity uh, refers to an attribute of a system behavior that when there is, when something happens, there is a response. There is a, in some form in, within the system, a response. And so it, it is the, um, the idea that there is a responsive relationship between conditions and uh, a design response, or better yet, that the design, the process of design produces a framework within which uh, there is a responsiveness to the system. Uh, and this hopefully will become clearer as I contrast it to um, its opposite, which is a, re a structural rigidity to systems, which I am going to present as one of the key characteristics of 20th century modernism. <clears throat> uh, and reflexivity uh, in this talk becomes the key attribute of what some people have postulated as being worthy of characterization as a second phase of modernity. And so that's where the term second modernity comes in. So reflexivity as a system attribute and second modernity as a useful way of, of thinking of the 21st century, especially from a design perspective. <coughs> and um, I welcome interruptions in the course of this uh, as we move along, um, especially if something's not clear. So, so as in all uh, histories, we start not from the beginning, but from the present. And the present perspective is what informs all of our histories. And every generation rewrites history from the perspective of the present. And so I take this example from last week um, out in the blogosphere, uh, a lot of chatter about uh, the upcoming 2012 Venice Biennale, um, the design gathering. Uh, there's a showcase for the state of design globally, very important. Uh, annual event, biannual event. Um, and the theme for the 2012 Biennale is uh, this, what you see here in the American Pavilion um, promotion here, the design actions for the common good. And this is increasingly uh, a visible direction that design culture is taking that instead of, um, as many people feel, designers talking to designers about design in a language that is inaccessible to the rest of the world, that, um, that that's a lot of fun and it actually, I would say, it does produce a great deal of useful uh, research results. But uh, its usefulness seems to be limited in many people's minds to the laboratory itself. And so you have extensive laboratory research going on that results in further laboratory research. 
and none of it ever leaves the laboratory. Not even the language uh, that is used in the laboratory, which is the ac academy to a large extent, uh, is the language is inaccessible to those outside of the academy. And so uh, design professions and architecture in particular have been subjected to uh, criti criticism that we are beside the point uh, and not only um, not helping the world, but actually doing visible harm. And we'll get into the context of that in a moment. Um, and so uh, we see increasingly an attempt to bring the results of the design research, which I claim is extremely valuable, to bring it outside of the laboratory, out of the Petri dish, and into real soil of the earth. And uh, I think the interest of design professions in informal settlements is one of the hopeful uh, signs that this is happening in a productive way. There's also, I mean, many of you could list other examples. The, um, uh, the exhibition in the United Nations uh, last year, I, I think it's still there, um, at the Cooper Hewitt about design for the other 90%, uh, which is the second installment of this same thing. But uh, I won't dwell on the other examples, just one of several dozen examples from very recent news. Um, this emerges out of something I published in 2009 um, called Notes on Post-Criticality Towards an Architecture of Reflexive Modernization. And just to summarize the argument in that, um, it points out that um, just as Charles Jenks used this kind of a trite device to say modernism died uh, at this time in the afternoon on this date and at, at this moment at the implosion of um, Pruitt Igo. Um, similarly, the um, uh, that there's this kind of planned obsolescence uh, instinct that architecture has adopted from capitalism that. Uh, and you look at Patrick Schumacher's declaration of the death of modernism being replaced by something he calls parametricism, which is, of course, ridiculous. Um, but Charles Jenks says modernism's over, now it's postmodernism, and that is increasingly not a, not a useful frame of reference to refer to, and so many of us don't even teach it in our history courses anymore. And there's been this new thing called criticality, post-criticality, which I claim in this piece published in 2009 is similarly uh, distracting, that there was this thing called critical architecture that uh, was critical of capitalism's um, uh, influences on architecture and the need to uh, disengage and resist capitalism that resulted in this uh, very rich period of architectural research, but also came with uh, undesirable consequences of disengaging architecture as a profession from the problems of the real world. And so the critical backlash of critical theory is to reject all theory. And so we have uh, Terry Eagleton, one of the four founding fathers of critical uh, theory, uh, denouncing his own movement. To, and then Michael Speaks writing it for Architectural Record encourages uh, schools around North America, especially in the Northeast, to give up this history theory thing and just get back to um, projects. And so the post-critical backlash to the critical uh, uh, came in full swing um, in the past decade. Um, but basically, I, um, in my 2009 piece, claimed that this is also an unnecessary distraction that takes away from the real point um, that um, is best grounded in the in a historical framing that comes out of um, sociology. And so this is the framework that I am proposing as being the most useful framework for understanding a lot of things going on in the 21st century uh, and in general, and uh, informal settlements and Medellin's very specifically. Um, the thesis of these gentlemen uh, who discovered each other, 
they discovered that they were each tapping into the same idea, but interpreting it in different ways. And the resonance of their work inspired them in 1994 to uh, work to collaborate on this publication, which is basically taking three of their essays and binding it under one cover. So they don't even agree on the same terms of reference, but this is part of what makes this so rich, is you have three independent explorations of an idea that seems to be emerging. And the idea goes something like this, and I'm going to be using the terms of reference uh, by Ulrich Beck, uh, who came here last year um, and talked about a lot of things, but not this, um, uh, until I engaged him over dinner. Um, he, he seems to have moved uh, beyond these terms of reference, but I argue uh, with him uh, that this is the big game in town. Um, and so, in a way, he's passed the baton, um, hopefully on to designers uh, to figure this out. But it goes something like this. Ulrich Beck is famous for coining the term risk society, which increasingly characterizes the conditions we, as a profession or multiple professions, are engaging in. That um, there are uh, serious challenges uh, that are the result of the solutions of the 20th century. Uh, the utopian modernism of the 20th century uh, succeeded so tremendously uh, that it yielded great breakthroughs, but it also yielded uh, unintended consequences. And for most of the 20th century, as these unintended consequences became more and more significant, the approach was uh, characterized by the technological fix or further um, big uh, breakthroughs. Uh, so all the problems that were created by modernism would be solved by a similar modernism. And um, that there are many, there's a lot of examples and evidence that that to a certain extent is true, but there are several examples that would argue, would demonstrate, or would indicate that um, no more of the same thing continues to create uh, insurmountable challenges. Um, exhibit A is uh, global warming, um, where, yes, maybe floating reflective items out in orbit might reduce the, the, the pace of overheating the globe, but it might also cause other problems that we can't anticipate. And so um, the reflexive, the use of reflexive in this title refers, is, a, is an implied critique of 20th century modernism is in that it is not reflexive. It is non-responsive. It is rigid and uh, characterized by uh, inflexibility. Utopian visions by their very nature um, are slow to change. And when problems arise, the typical response from designers is something to the effect of, well, it's, we haven't fully implemented our utopian vision yet, so give us a chance. Give us control of the landscape and the world, and we will deliver on our promises. You just have to give us the problem. The reason these problems are coming up is you have not yet given us total control. Um, and this is echoed in a critique by James C. Scott, Seen Like a State, and his other books, um, which is a vivid uh, critique of 20th century modernism in many ways. Maybe you've heard of Scott. It's, he's, his argument has become quite popular in, in design schools. Um, but the, at one point in the early days of modernism, um, architecture was a vehicle for delivering uh, the benefits of technological and political revolution to the largest number of people. It was very much up front in um, the discourse around moder early modern movements of uh, the 20s and before that the, uh, that the world was transforming, was in the midst of transformation, and it was opening a new era for humanity where democratic institutions would spread um, 
power and uh, democracy to populations previously um, without access to these things, education, health care, medicine, uh, and general well-being from this technological industrial revolution that wouldn't just create benefits for the wealthiest in society, but spread them to the global majority. And this was very much the mission of the early modern movements. Uh, something happened after World War II uh, where this was transformed, and we get what uh, James C. Scott distinguishes uh, from the larger goals of modernism. He calls, he makes the distinction uh, labeling it high modernism. And if one um, embraces that uh, critique, then what we emerge from that is that the reaction in the 70s and 80s to the excesses of, of modernism is really a reaction against high modernism. And so postmodernism is perhaps a reaction against, or better understood as post-high modernism. But the larger trajectory of modernity as a phenomenon uh, continues uh, and continues in very significant ways uh, and, in, and this is in part uh, behind the uh, fading away of postmodernism as a relevant uh, framework of, of understanding things. And so um, from our current perspective we look back and uh, things like uh, Buckminster Fuller and a lot of the environmental movement of the 60s and 70s start to take on uh, greater relevance to the design world. And this is an image from Bruce Mao, uh, Massive Change, the exhibition and book, that design is a key consideration in that far from being simply a small department uh, in the marketing area of many corporations, it's really the big circle. It's the approach to problem solving that uh, is capable of integrating the insights of multiple perspectives, multiple different uh, expertise. Uh, all comes together uh, in design. And <clears throat> this distinguishes it from the prevalent approaches of the 20th century, where um, the professions splintered off into ever narrowing considerations um, of technical problem solving. And so the problem of uh, transportation would be solved by a highway engineer and cut a highway through our cities. And, um, and because the problem was narrowly defined as getting as many people as possible with the highest degree of freedom within a capitalist system from point A to point B. Now, um, there were many secondary side effects uh, that can be listed and are listed um, in courses in this building um, that all end up at uh, global warming somehow. And design is the solution to this point of view, this approach to problem solving by taking multiple considerations from multiple points of view and integrating them in a more holistic way. And this brings us to the Netherlands um, where uh, arguably, um, since the first floods in the ninth century, uh, the extreme hardship imposed by high population density and low elevation in the Netherlands has uh, required this population and this society to deal with constant threat of uh, crisis and disaster, natural and man-made disaster, resulting in a mindset of collective decision making characterized by the water boards that had to organize uh, across the landscape locally and in larger systems how to prevent flooding uh, of their fields. And this stands in stark contrast to the mindset of North America where uh, a sense of unlimited resources, in particular land, has led to a distinctive uh, approach that uh, is based on the presumption of excess and abundance and endless supply uh, with serious consequences. 
Um, and so in the Dutch landscape, the, the, um, the population gathered around uh, urban centers in a way of, as a strategy for preserving agricultural land. And so over the decades, the centuries and decades, even to the uh, present, you get uh, high concentrations of population um, and uh, preservation of the farmland only partially um, uh, weakened lately through uh, the adoption of American-style governance of land use. Um, but uh, the Dutch approach uh, is also characterized by the necessity of not just talking about things, but of demonstrating, uh, demonstrating phenomena, uh, which I refer to as Missouri rules. Um, Missouri is the show me state. And this is a kind of a counter theoretical. Instead of just developing theories and talking about things, uh, you should demonstrate them. And so famously in 1995, when the Dutch government uh, announced that in order to satisfy the housing needs of the growing Netherlands, um, they would need to build 800,000 housing units. And uh, at the time, as they were uh, warming up to American land use uh, governance uh, mechanisms, uh, free market mechanisms of land use, um, uh, this was an exhibition um, in Rotterdam by West 8. Adrian Choyza comes here quite a bit, I believe. Um, what do 800,000 housing units look like if they are done in the North American tradition of single-family housing? And this was a demonstration, a visceral de demonstration, that the quality of the architecture might not matter because of, or it might get lost in the sheer volume of housing. And so this is a demonstration of what 800,000 houses might look like. Um, and so it was a very, it was, it was a very effective uh, critique of uh, design approaches and governance. Uh, but it also characterized um, um, Dutch approaches to design engagement uh, for the next several decades, uh, which has also incorporated computer technology um, and also opened up the discourse to other factors. And here you see this is a, a computer game, a video game, basically, uh, to replace rigid planning approaches. That instead of planners producing a document that says, in, in 50 years, this is what the world should look like, or our piece of the world should look like, instead, um, MVRDV uh, collaborated with computer scientists to develop uh, gaming software to play out uh, extreme scenarios and uh, that reflects more the dynamic quality of you do one thing, you make one intervention into the landscape, and other things happen that might be unpredictable. And so it's a more of a, <clears throat> it's a more resilient, flexible means of modeling that are facilitated by computers that has since become uh, a very rich uh, area of design uh, intervention uh, and data collection <clears throat> whereby uh, by keeping track of the location of cell phones uh, one can actually map phenomena that on the fly dynamically in real time that were previously uh, unex inaccessible and so here you see um, Singapore mapped in terms of cell phone activity at, at certain times. Uh, this is done through MIT in collaboration with Singapore. Um, and another characteristic uh, that is emerging, um, so I should um, clarify that I'm trying to show examples that are suggestive of the kind of approaches that might characterize a reflexive uh, design approach of second modernity in contrast to 20th century more rigid uh, utopian uh, design approaches. Uh, and the hope is that by becoming sensitive to these attributes of design approaches, 
both coming out of the professional world of designers, but also elsewhere. Um, we can uh, start to uh, enrich our tool set uh, for design in ways that make design as effective as it needs to be to uh, more seriously uh, contribute to, the cha to facing the challenges of the 21st century. And so the, um, so from the, the Dutch approach of, uh, it emerges out of extreme necessity of sheer survival um, to the kinds of approaches that are facilitated by computer software and ubiquitous data collection uh, from satellites to cell phones to uh, all of these social media and the invasion of privacy that is possible and facilitated by computers that this is data collection uh, and redeployment and visualization uh, that helps us both uh, to analyze phenomena in a way that we previously were not able to, but also engage uh, with uh, problem solving in a way that was also previously unavailable to us. Um, so from the Dutch disaster landscape approaches to computational tools, um, we turn now to uh, something more familiar uh, and that's been around for quite a while, which is what designers do. Um, and here's uh, an image of a, a residential tower, quite interesting design-wise, um, this dynamic form um, with pools on each balcony. Um, quite appealing, something that might even get great kudos in the design literature. But here's its context, uh, which is um, in the midst of the informal settlements of uh, Sao Paulo, uh, Parasopolis. You've yeah, been there. Right? Yeah. Um, so basically, this is not, in, in many ways, this is a conflictual relationship. But in other ways, if you look at it from an economic and land use point of view, this is actually a symbiotic relationship. And if you look at it from uh, the functioning of a city, it is also a symbiotic relationship in that um, informal settlements provide housing uh, that uh, formal um, governments and market <laughs> forces uh, in the formal sector are incapable of providing. And so informal settlements is a resilient, dynamic, uh, spontaneous, uh, resourceful response to demand uh, that makes up for the inadequacies of formal arrangements, both of state governments and market-driven economies. And they provide housing not just for um, criminals, uh, which is kind of the, uh, the stereotype uh, that prevails in much of the world, but um, also workers, uh, including government workers. As a matter of fact, I know government workers in Indonesia working in the offices to obliterate informal settlements uh, who live themselves in informal settlements. Um, and the workers in the people who clean the pool and uh, maintain the tennis courts and the grounds and clean the houses uh, all live uh, on the other side of this uh, barricade um, guarded by armed guards. The guards themselves live on the left side of the barricade. So it's um, symbi it's a symbiotic relationship in terms of housing supply for a workforce uh, that supports everything that happens on the right side of the barricade. It's also a symbiotic relationship in terms of land development that the reason that the luxury residential tower on the right could be built is because it was quite easy to dislocate the settlers who lived on that land um, very quickly. They didn't have to approach uh, formal landowners, uh, the 138 parcels, uh, and negotiate a purchase from every single one of them. They could simply expropriate um, the squatters uh, because the land was illegally settled. And so um, the informal settlements provide a land bank that makes these larger luxury developments possible, uh, just in terms of a land uh, consolidation point of view. And so it's a fairly complex arrangement. 
Um, and the physical attribute of this landscape that's probably most striking is the wall itself. Um, and so, um, but there are other, and this slide isn't very clear, but this is Dharavi in India, the formal infrastructure development of water supply to the formal city becomes a uh, walkway uh, for the residents of the informal settlement. Uh, and they walk on top of this pipeline um, in order to get um, electricity in the informal settlements, um, young men risk their lives to tap into the formal electrical grid. Uh, same is true for cable TV, um, water supply, you name it, uh, the infrastructure is available. Okay, which brings us to Medellin, finally. Um, Sergio Fajardo, uh, you've probably been introduced to this character already, um, but he was not the first one to uh, come up with any of these ideas in Medellin. He simply um, was successful in deploying them uh, in a big way. Um, the architects and planners had been working for decades prior to um, Sergio Fajardo's election uh, to mayor of Medellin in 2003. Um, he started his term in 2004. Yeah. And, uh, he simply deployed the plans that had been under development for several decades. Uh, his father was a, a well-known architect, and, um, and so he grew up in a circle of the design community in Medellin, and he simply deployed these ideas um, very dramatically. His primary challenge was to um, make good and follow through on a phenomena that had already, uh, was already well underway. Um, you've, you've looked at the murder rate um, peaking in the early 90s and descending for all the reasons it descended because of the success in the drug wars. Um, but because of the success in the drug wars, Medellin was about to be or was in the process of being uh, flooded with uh, former guerrillas uh, who left Medellin when they were 14 and uneducated. Uh, they were handed uh, an AK-47, and they grew up for the next 20 years um, as professional soldiers in the drug wars. They were being sent back to Medellin with no skills, no education, except on how to shoot. And they came back with their guns. And so as this population of uneducated 30-somethings um, who were very good at shooting and had no means of income, as they came back to Medellin, the challenge was to give them something to do other than um, a life of crime. And so um, the campaign was to make Medellin the most educated city in the world, um, or in, in Colombia, to give these young men an alternative to crime. And so here you see the... Um, I don't know why the words aren't showing up, but um, basically you get the idea. Medellin is the dotted red line. Uh, uh, many cities in Colombia benefited greatly from the reduction of the drug trafficking in the cities, <clears throat> but Medellin uh, made the most of it um, by reducing the murder rate even more dramatically than the other cities of Colombia by mobilizing these education campaigns um, that would lead to paid work. And so um, the, the primary drive was education, but um, they needed a convincing way, sorry, this didn't turn out, they needed a convincing way to demonstrate that they were serious. And so they turned to design uh, and construction. And you know much of this story where they, instead of um, designing world-class uh, facilities for the wealthiest, they would locate these uh, libraries and parks where the most crime had occurred. And so they were targeting, their target audience was not the privileged of Medellin, their target audience were the most deprived population. And so um, the, just, you probably have seen this bridge. Um, Maybe briefly. Uh, briefly, well here it is both brief and small. Um, two warring neighborhoods uh, had a history of uh, sharks and jets kind of uh, uh, 
turf warfare and assassination. And so the response was to design and build a bridge between the two neighborhoods um, in a collaborative method uh, that brought the two communities together, not so they could be more effective in their uh, mutual annihilation, but so they could develop social ties. And so this is an example of a piece of physical infrastructure and design that actually very directly serves as an instrument of making things better. Uh, the transportation network is a similarly <coughs> clear, direct instrument of simply giving the people in the informal settlements on the steep hillsides access to the economy and social opportunities of the rest of the city. Uh, so it's a rights to the city kind of uh, gesture, very direct, uh, common sense way to give people access to all the benefits of uh, urban urbanization. Um, when Fajardo came to Boston, he gave a very impassioned presentation about the design not being the most important thing. Design is a means to an end. It's a vehicle. And first and foremost, it's a vehicle for convincing people and demonstrating in the spirit of the demonstration effects, uh, as mentioned, the Dutch and the Missouri rules approach, um, to demonstrate to the people that this was not just talk. This wasn't just some government uh, program <coughs> with no physical transformative effects. Uh, he used architecture and infrastructure design and development as a very convincing vehicle for demonstrating uh, their commitment to transforming the city and the people's lives, the lives of as many people as possible. And I'm referring back to the original intention of the modern movements uh, prior to, uh, in the interwar period even, to spread the greatest benefits to the greatest number of people. Uh, and so this is very much in keeping with that early aspiration of the modern movements. Uh, but the question is, um, are the means by which this is done, is it a top-down uh, engagement in the same uh, approach as the 20th century? I mean, Fajardo is coming in, he's got four years as mayor, and then it's over. So the clock is ticking from the first moment of his, uh, of his uh, government. And he has to deliver on these promises in four years. He's got several hundred million dollars to do it, uh, which was basically given to him by the miraculous effect of simply making a commitment to not steal. By simply not stealing from uh, the government, so all of a sudden there was an extra several hundred million dollars to work with. And so uh, the budget was there simply by committing to not steal it. Uh, but they have to deploy it, and get it built in a convincing way within the four-year time period. So by definition, it absolutely has to be top-down driven in terms of its deployment. So the key question uh, in my research, and I don't know if uh, you will be hearing from Hota Samper from MIT. He will come, mm -hmm. but not give a separate lecture. Okay. Um, <clears throat> but Hota is from Medellin. He's doing a PhD at MIT. He is very much looking at the processes by which this, uh, these interventions are deployed, the participatory planning and design processes by which this, these things come about. One of the things that I find fascinating is in the King of Spain library, um, it, it exhibits all the characteristics of bad high modern architecture, yet it is effective nonetheless. I tell my students in the design studio, whatever you do, don't make hermetically sealed boxes. Don't create, don't create these uh, you know, voluptuous forms that are sealed capsules. Well, here we have voluptuous forms that are hermetically sealed capsules. Um, to its credit, there is a, the biggest thing that's being designed here is the space between the two spaceship capsules um, that very well um, defines a uh, public space. So um, a lot of the things, um, it, so it's too short to go into all the details of what it does wrong. 
Um, but somehow it still gets it right. And I go back to what Fajardo was saying, that this was a very much a very clear demonstration of the social commitment to bringing the greatest benefits to the largest number of people uh, and granting dignity um, where before there was only fear and uh, people hiding out in their houses for fear of stray bullets killing their children. And so the public space, despite the hermetically sealed quality of these uh, coffee cans, uh, the public space has been completely uh, reinvigorated. Uh, it's filled with people. This is their living room. And now it's more like the hill towns of Italy uh, than it is the slums of the developing world. I have slides from my honeymoon from the hill towns of Italy that look not so different from this. Um, and uh, attention has you know, become global. Um, it, and the transformations are downtown. They are in the different neighborhoods. You've probably seen these different uh, developments in Medellin. And the tourist boom, uh, it's one of the most popular tourist attractions, destinations in Latin America. These are pictures from the New York Times travel section. Uh, in 2007, I believe. Um, just like the Museum of Science, only better. A lot of it is outdoors. Uh, school groups uh, basically are constantly occupying these places. Now here's one of the library parks that I think exhibits the opposite of the King of Spain Library in that it's openness to the point where you can't even tell what's inside and what's outside. And the people have really adopted it as their living room um, even in the midst of the same old squatter settlement housing, uh, the self-constructed housing, it really is a vindication for those who have been saying for decades, um, stop with the housing already. The houses are fine. Focus on infrastructure, running water, um, sewage treatment, uh, managing, not sewage treatment, but managing sewage, uh, secure right, land rights, so they can actually invest in their own housing. And then um, focus on education and public facilities and public amenities that give them a sense of ownership and dignity. And so uh, the difference between Parasopolis, the um, very physical, clear demonstration of who's important and who is garbage uh, in Parasopolis is uh, countered by its opposite in Medellin where the absence of walls between the neighborhood and these fancy world-class architectural interventions uh, makes it clear that uh, these people have rights to the city. Um, and I'm referring to a lot of the literature recently about the rights to the city. It's a whole literature that is of, of interest probably to this course. Um, and. Um, this is my final slide. This is a project by one of my students uh, for Caracas. Um, the um, can't really see it, but she rendered it during a rainstorm. This is a, a piece of infrastructure that connects um, a mansion that was built before the informal settlements came in and is now owned by the city uh, and has been redesigned as a community cultural center for the benefit of the, of the neighborhood around it. But there is no way to get up there. There's basically a, a fortress cliff wall here. And um, Cheryl Bratzos designed uh, an elevator, stairway, library, water collection facility um, to connect, to provide a water source for the neighborhood and give them a physical connection up to the community center and extend it by including uh, library programs in it. So just um, uh, hopefully I'm provoking um, some questioning uh, in your, to inform your research as you move forward. Um, the, the key questions I would suggest you look at as you look at the evidence presented by Medellin is uh, whether or not this is uh, an example of the same old business as usual, top-down uh, design government interventions, or whether it's something else. And if it is something else, uh, 
how would you characterize this something else? And then really uh, the main question is to what extent uh, does the approach uh, in Medellin warrant or is even capable of translation so that it can be effectively deployed elsewhere? Uh, because we have a lot of challenges uh, in the 21st century um, that are to a large extent a result of the weaknesses of the approaches we deployed as a, a, the design professions in particular deployed in the 20th century. And so um, this research, I would argue, is very important to what we now turn our attention to doing and achieving in the 21st century. Thank you. That's, I'll stop there.